This is the Daily Tech News Show for Wednesday, December 29th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. Sarah and Roger and Joe and Amos, they're all around too. Uh, but it's time to look back on the year that was 2021. And as many of you know, we have DTNS, but we also have a longer show called Good Day Internet. So our producer, Joe, combed through both shows to look for some highlights that exemplify the big stories, the interesting discussions, the fun diversions we had on both shows. So here is the best of 2021. Enjoy. Have you uh, have you had a chance to really like pay much attention to the CES stuff earlier in the week? The the video that breaks CES out into the news cycle is some ABC Good Morning America's cameras on a a a phone that rolls up, right? Yeah, or right. a television that splits into a tablet that splits into a robot like that can pour kitchen. you wine. Yeah. This year, you couldn't be there, so you couldn't yeah. have your host, you know, at the booth having the robot pour you a glass of wine, right? Because yep. that's great TV. Yeah, so you can't do that, uh, and and I think that contributes to. Ryzen winning best of CES because it's yes. a, a more conceptual thing plays better uh, in in a world where nobody's actually in any of the booths and all the political events and everything else just kind of meant like we don't have a dry news cycle so we don't need to fill a slot. Well, and and yeah, although I do think that if there was a super compelling gadget, there is for the reason that we're going to do the Point show three. that we're doing today that is not going to mention the politics stuff really at all, even in the way that we mention it normally on DTNS, that there would have been a place for the like, and and here's the thing that your kid's going to love. Because yeah. CES is always a first and foremost a trade show. The whole kind of newsmaker aspect came, like big newsmaker, came a little later. Like like where, where did those news yeah. stories start? No, where those those news start? stories started with the companies that were producing them. Or the yeah, they, they started outside CES. CES was the was their was their platform to push it out, but it wasn't like yes, C that CES <laughs> three major waves over the last ten years: <laughs> smartphones, televisions in general, for which has still been a thing. Three D televisions is an example for which of an empty hype cycle for which televisions went through and CES played a part in. I'm not saying they invented it. I'm saying that they are the clearinghouse of. Uh, of the rubber meets the road again in a dead news cycle where you can where where these stories become talking points on a level that they don't otherwise unless you are in this field and then IoT the rollable foldable thing is equivalent to 3D TVs and if it was a normal CES in a dry news week that it would yeah. it would be getting close to that but I, I mean, totally agree with everything you said vodka Ooh. and clams though in 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 clam chowder yeah in the clam chowder yeah there's vodka in my clam chowder? No, not <laughs> yours, but if you want it, it'd be better. Really? Why did no one tell Sarah this before? Would you cook for a restaurant a few shots into, like, you know, three gallons worth of clam chowder? Alcoholic soup? No, that's... <laughs> Oh, thank have you, you ever have alcoholic you ever tried soup? Try alcoholic soup before you 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 give it a bad name. We're not going to spend a lot of time on on the show. We had we had texted about it. Uh, did we want to go into it or just? Do we want to go into hashtag uh, hell portal hashtag portal to hell regarding the suspension of the president from all these different platforms? We're going to have it in DTNS. It's going to be a quick hit. Like as yeah. part of like here's all the technology stuff around what happened, but we're not going to have a big discussion about it. Is this appropriate? for the platforms mm -hmm. like you know in in the cultivation of the platform's own worldview you know when do you deplatform somebody when do you suspend them is there transparency on how long they're being suspended what do they need to do to cure their suspension like uh and what we saw yesterday is what we've seen from all these platforms forever which is you know the uh, uh, whose line is it anyway? You know, welcome to social media, where uh, the you know we make up the rules and the points don't matter. So yeah, uh, we we clearly have rules that we will follow, and we just change those rules. Yes, exactly. Uh, uh, so uh, and I I don't say that meaning I I necessarily agree or disagree with their decisions, but if you're if you're you know trying to see them as neutral players, I I don't think that's accurate you know, them reacting to the moment, uh, uh, the, the controversy of the moment. And this is a massive controversy. I don't want to downplay no. uh, uh, what it is. And they're making it up as they go along. 
because there's no that's, precedent. And that's yeah, I've made my intentions clear that this is indeed a hell portal, uh, portal to hell. The only thing I would say is that this particular situation, because of the gravity of it, is not a portal to hell. It is indeed where hell. we arrive after we traverse. <laughs> after you go through the portal. I mean, in in the wide scale of things, you know, newspapers have been around for hundreds of years. Uh, television has been around for almost a hundred years. Uh, so, so they're learning right now. We, we can't look back and say, well, for a long time, it's been well established that this is what you do in that situation. That said, you can, you can make judgments about like, okay, if they have to make it up as they go along, how good are they at doing that? I think that there is a tremendous problem with both Twitter and Facebook specifically that they created a message board without mods and only admins. And if you create a world without mods and only admins, uh, uh, however you want to define what those would be on those platforms, then every decision that is made is the decision from God. And that's no, the No, but the, the, the community will moderate itself, Justin. That's it. I'm quoting Tom Merritt from Buzz Out Loud, circa 2008. <laughs> Cloud was so we had we had the net, right? That was the the ability to even connect. Cloud was we'll we'll take your data and and you don't have to have it local. Mm -hmm. What's decentralized? Like if we get, I'm not saying we will, but my hope is that we end the next wave is a big decentralization. You get to control your data. It's not in any one place, so nobody else can control it but you. What would we call that? Well, people talk now about data lakes. Yeah, I was That's gonna say maybe. Yeah. What's a I decentralized mean, lake? Minnesota. A no. pond. <laughs> data pond. Yes, there's over a thousand of those. I still think data lake and data pond and like all that kind of stuff. Cause then you can have like rivers running between them and like oceans for the big you can have. Well, you know, yeah. if you make it a tributary or an estuary, then you can Ooh, have a delta. Like, so right. like a delta could be the edge of the public cloud right. and your personal Oh, that's good. Your right. private cloud Plus, could be the could be the fresh water in the and public it's distributed. All salty. Yeah. yeah, it's distributed. So there's a bunch of these little lakes and then there's the mm -hmm. ocean. And so oh. it's the data. So then your data lakes works with the with the uh with the delta. Yeah. The, Underground. Yeah, I was gonna say data aquifer, data aquifer. right? Yeah. Or right. um data dams, reservoir. Yeah. Reservoirs. Data reservoir. Okay. Yeah, yeah, like your personal data reservoir. Right. You your data same. lake is your personal backup, but then you also want it to be backed up somewhere else securely. You need, you need to have yeah. potable data. Potable we do data. need to have potable data. <laughs> that do not poop in my data, kids. <laughs> oh, seriously. GameStop stock started January at eighteen dollars a share. Quite a bit up from the three dollars and thirty cents a share it had been trading at in the summer, uh, but. It rose even more, 69% January 22nd, triggering a halt to its trading. Then Monday, this past Monday, January 25th, its trading was halted nine times. It reached $224 a share on Tuesday evening and was past $300 early Wednesday. Molly Wood, why is this happening? How did this start? <laughs> this is happening because uh I guess the the sort of shortest possible version uh, is that the internet has discovered the world's largest casino and you have this sort of confluence of things happening, right? Trading is way more accessible in part because of Robinhood. You named an app Robinhood. What did you think was going to happen? Um, people remain super furious about things like the 2008 financial collapse and also shorting. And there's like no small amount of kind of Tesla fanboy rage that's playing into what were happening here. People were angry at all of this shorting of GameStop uh, that also left markets totally vulnerable to what we're seeing today. And they've suddenly figured out how to apply like crowdsourcing and actually what I've been calling Google bombing to the stock market. They're coming from primarily this Reddit board called Wall Street Bets, this subreddit. And it's existed for a long time. And it's a place to, you know, it's got like hardcore day traders in it, some people who might have at some point been working for the same firms that are engaged in this activity right now. Um, this, again, this combination of events, maybe a little extra money, maybe more time on their hands about the pandemic, maybe just this kind of like pent up rage about inequality and this kind of edgelord troll sensibility 
that just said, like, we can do this thing for the lulls. You put this, you call it a, a dirty old trick, a trick that's been going on for a long time. Does this move the needle at all in any sort of regulatory direction? Or is it still just a dirty old trick that a bunch of internet trolls figured out how to exploit? I mean, I think it is just a dirty old trick that internet trolls figured out how to exploit. Like, so far, all of it is legal. There are, that we know of, right? There are certain rules around market mani manipulation. But I think that like organizing all your friends out in the open to all buy the same stock probably does not violate those rules. Short selling, at least now, doesn't violate any rules. And to be honest, if I if if I thought there was going to be a regulatory response to this, I I would imagine that it would protect the hedge funds and not the redditors. Like mm -hmm. I don't think they're going to make rules against short selling. If anything, if they if there is regulation that results from this it will probably hurt individuals who want to buy into the stock market. And that's actually very bad. Like the, the worst outcome here is that by showing how manipulatable this system is and by doing things that are perfectly acceptable behavior when they're done by hedge funds or even investment banks, it's possible that you would have regulators come in and go like, maybe we, maybe everybody who buys into the stock market has to be accredited or, Maybe if there's a certain amount of volatility and everybody's trying to buy the same stock at once, we just don't let them. Reddit's not saying GameStop's going to make a comeback. They're just saying, nope. let's all pile in and buy it and right. screw over these short sellers. So you would have to find another way to say they're doing something illegal, and you'd have to figure out who to prosecute. There's not a particular ringleader. Um, how a lot of big firms have bought the basically the rights to early trading information on Robinhood. They can, they can essentially front run these trades. So like a firm called Citadel might realize that everybody's buying into GameStop, get on board with that, make a ton of money, and then loan that money to bail out Melvin Capital and then have that money be invested later and make money on it, right? So like at and the end two, of the day- there's two Citadels, by the way, if you're out there reading this, there's Citadel Securities, which has a deal with Robinhood, and then there's Citadel, which is doing what Molly's talking about. Um, and they're both going to benefit from this. And they're both, and they're both going to benefit. Exactly. Like at the end of the day, we shouldn't shed too many tears for what we think of the establishment investors, because all of those same investors are going to make money. Some retail investors on Reddit are going to make a lot of money. Some retail investors on Reddit are going to be left holding the bag. Cause right now there's a lot of pressure on them not to sell, even though the stock is really high and they could have made a lot of money. And so then now you're going to have this weird game theory thing to see who sells first, which will cause the price to go back down. And some individuals may lose an incredible amount of money. The, the whole thing is, is a dangerous game. It's twisted and crazy. I just can't believe it's all over a company I used to trade Madden 05 in for for 10 bucks. <laughs> The incoming head of the Senate Antitrust Subcommittee, Senator Amy Klobuchar, plans to introduce a new antitrust bill targeted at big tech companies that would place limits on acquisitions. If the bill became law, here's how it would shift the burden of proof onto companies with more than 50% market share. So that's how this, this bill would work. You, It would work by shifting the burden of proof, and I'll explain what that means in a second, and it would only apply to companies with more than 50% market share, which right now, that's a lot of big tech companies. If you are one of those companies, you would have to prove that an acquisition would not create an appreciable risk of materially lessening competition. In other words, if this were the law now, uh, and Facebook were buying Instagram now, Facebook would have to prove that buying Instagram wouldn't hurt competition rather than what they had to do under the current law, which is having investigators prove uh, like you would right under the way the law used to work. You had to prove that it would hurt competition for Facebook to buy Instagram. They want to change the law to say Facebook has to prove it won't. Some conduct would be presumed anti-competitive unless the company can prove otherwise. So let's say Amazon shuts a company off its platform for what it says were violations of policy. Right now, the company that got shut out would have to go to court and prove that it wasn't just a violation of policy, it's anti-competitive. Under this bill, Amazon would have to prove why it was not anti-competitive. And a large company could face antitrust liability even if the market in which it took place was not precisely defined by the claimant. There's a whole load of complicated case law around market definition. For instance, I won't go down this rabbit hole now, but apparently Pepsi and Coke have been ruled in court not to be in the same market 
because brand loyalty makes customers less price sensitive. So Justin, this is just Amy Klobuchar trying this again. She apparently tried it in the last Congress. It didn't, didn't float then. Got any chance of floating now? You need 10 members of the opposite party. So I don't know if immediately this would get all 50 senators from either party. It would be curious to see whether or not this is something that you could rally the banners and pitch a perfect game on if Amy Klobuchar wanted to get all of the Democrats on on board. Some might not see that it goes far enough because it doesn't break up certain uh, tech companies, something that Elizabeth Warren has pushed. Some might think that it goes too far uh, on the on the blue dog side, like on Joe Manchin. What I don't like about this kind of bill is having it targeted at big tech. I don't like laws that are made for specific companies. And this reeks of that a little bit. But what I do like about it is that it's not making major policy changes. It's just trying to adjust the levels and say, let's make it a little easier for someone to prove an antitrust case because we're going to shift the burden of proof. Uh, I haven't worked through all the implications of doing that. Maybe I, if I did, I would be horrified by it. But in principle, that seems to be a better way to go around adjusting things than to have these more extreme measures, at least to me. Hold on. We forgot something. Oh, uh, uh, let's check in with Lamar, <laughs> who's been illustrating today's show. Today's Friday. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. So, so th th this is, um, this is a sad family who has a, I, I took a long time to draw this guy's. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They're sad because they live at the end of the zip code and they don't oh, have internet. Right. Yeah. So we, we <laughs> is wanna... that how it works? The person yes. at the front of the zip code gets the one internet connection. Yes. And then, yeah. yeah. So your, your 30 cents can help this family. Oh, he had, oh, wow. He, are you kidding me? Are you <laughs> kidding? Tom, are you kidding me? I need no way. Your picture looks a lot, lot, a lot like Lamar. <laughs> <laughs> I what did you make very this? nice. Yeah, Wait, Super Bowl, that's great. What, Super Bowl 15? When, when Super was Bowl that? 15. I don't, I don't count. Did you spell Philadelphia with two L's? Uh, it looks like I did, yeah. Okay. <laughs> how, how, about, uh, how about this turkey that I okay. drew? That is that is epic. You know what? I don't. Why do? Here's a here's a train that I drew. Goes to Chicago. Okay, I really do want to know. I'm with Sarah now. Why do you have these? <laughs> I had a brief career as a cartoonist. This is Super Duck with two C's. We <laughs> beat <laughs> of you. Super Duck. I never finished the last frame. Apparently, it ain't. It Justin ain't Robert Young. Yes. Going to Texas. I am. Yeah, you know, it's a, a city that I spent a ton of time in because of Brian and South by Southwest and, and, and all that. Uh, it just kind of uh, feels like the right, uh, the right move. Although the fact that it is uh, going to snow here on Monday uh, uh, is, is not something that I'm excited yeah. about. Well, I didn't know that now. it did that. You're going to get blamed is what's going to happen. People are like, oh, you buy a house in Texas and then it snows and it's well, nine degrees. I'm getting the hell out of here. So like... Uh, I'm leaving on Friday. Uh, uh, what I've heard is that this kind of weather is once in a hundred years kind of thing. So in a lot of ways, I'm pretty excited that I'll be moving right, in. Because they got it out of the way. Yeah. So uh, we, we can reset that clock to a hundred years. Awesome. What was the movie funny. about the room? Oh, oh right. that one. The one uh, with uh, Franco. Yeah. Yes. James Franco. James Franco. James Franco. That, I think... I think that was the last movie I saw in the theater. It was Christmas the Day, like, Artist, three years ago. The disaster, disaster Artist, yes. that's it. At the end of Disaster Artist, you know, when they like kind of like roll the credits where it's like, Tommy Wiseau, blah, 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 you know? And, it, and it's like, no one knows where Tommy Wiseau is actually from. Fade to black. <laughs> where I was like, really? That's the end of the movie? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Nobody knows so where I'm weird. actually from. I made up this whole backstory about Greenville, Illinois, and I never believed it. Paid some people off to. Tom came yeah. out of a photo mat with your with your kind of like oh I'm like close to St. Louis thing. Never believed yeah. it. And then people are like, wait, but you sound nothing like you're being like the people from that area, Tom. He even faked that <laughs> that little clip of him when he was much supposedly. No, much that's younger. the actual. That's an actual person. It's just not me. Yeah. <laughs> it was pretty obvious, Tom. Yeah, I'm you don't glad we're just like finally that. airing it out. I know. <laughs> Greenville. I know. And I'm going to admit that this is a green screen behind me. It's, it's time to <laughs> let go of all the illusions. I, I had to delete TikTok. Mm. I, I, you could say we, for a story. We could, 
Because, could... because why? Because it was too addictive. Absolutely right. Yeah, I, I yeah. downloaded it for a story because I was trying to find something else um, that was yep. being uh, that was trending on TikTok, and I opened it up to search for that particular hashtag. And then 17 hours later, I thought, whoa, this is bad. <laughs> I found the compliment rap battles, where instead of tearing the other rapper down, you're trying to compliment them. I found some lyrics, some compliment battle lyrics here. Would you like to hear some example? Mm -hmm. Sure. I'm With terrible caution. at rapping compared to you. Plus, your voice is nice and your hair is too. <laughs> Give a high five to your parents, dude. <laughs> That's, uh, that sounds and like it rhymes. It, sounds... it rhymes. Okay. Give props right. to your mums and props where it's due because they did a good job taking care of you. You should take a day <laughs> off like Ferris Bueller. <laughs> ah, right. Yes. That's where the rhyme gets kind of fun. I like right. how your breath is fresher than 60 Tic Tacs. You can bag a beat like those hickory stick snacks. <laughs> you know, that totally sounds like the Sugar See? Hill Gang could totally do that. And it would sound not out of place. <laughs> Somehow you became water there, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh. Jack Dorsey's first tweet has sold for 2.9 million. <sighs> Why? There's some there's some NFT things where I'm just like it's grown. Come on. It's, it's newsworthy, but it's also grown worthy. It's yeah. Tough. So help me with the metaphysics of this. Metaphysics. <laughs> because <laughs> mentally I'm looking at this and I'm like, okay, it's the first edition. Of course, we print it the first edition to everyone who was in a bookstore. So there's, you know, well, probably dozens at that point, or maybe even hundreds. Like, I don't know how many people were on Twitter when Jack sent his first tweet. Like, how do you, you know, right. I, it's oh, and, like, and I the, mean, you're, you're asking for people, you, you're asking how people are objectively determining the value of something that's relative. No, I'm not the uh, charge no? with the market will bear. I'm not asking for objective value. What I'm literally asking is, you know, Given that the first tweet happened over a decade ago and was published to everyone on the service at that time, which was probably a really short list, but you know, is is what is the first tweet, right? Because a, does a tweet exist until other people read it? If there are fifty oh. people on the service or fifty thousand people on the service, which one is the first tweet? Like, very, it's very. Or did he basically say, "This is the first tweet I sent, and I am making it a thing, and now I am selling your rights to the first tweet," which is like. You know what I mean? It's like if lawyers made art for people who like to, you know, if lawyers right. made art for hustlers, it sounds a lot like this. Great that it made three million for charity. How searching for help online can be healthy. And I think we all agree that the last year has affected us all, sometimes not in the greatest of ways. Mental health is a hmm. big concern. So, if you want to help yourself, do you search online? Well, aren't you supposed to talk to a doctor? Isn't it kind of dangerous to self-diagnose? But, Peter, you found some recommendations that searching for help with mental help online isn't always a bad idea. And uh, you just have to go in certain directions, huh? Yeah, yeah. It's really important to kind of evaluate the sources. Uh, like anything on the internet, if you're, th there's going to be fantastic uh, advice out there. And there's also going to be really, really terrible advice. So uh, the, the trick is to figure out how to to tell those two bits of advice apart. Um, I, I was reluctant to kind of name any sources as being, look, you can trust everything that these people say because I'm not a, a doctor myself. So um, I, I felt very uncomfortable uh, offering that advice. But the I guess the, the rule of thumb that I found uh, in the last week looking at this stuff is uh, just just ignore the stuff that says that, hey, we're going to cure you of your anxiety or your depression by the time you get to the end of this uh, YouTube clip or whatever it is. Anything that says that uh, it's going to be an easy fix, I think, starts to feel a little bit kind of self-help guru-y and, um, and not so valuable. But uh, I, I found that there were some really, really great sources. And, and to be honest, this, this all did come about because Google did an update to their search product where um, if you do a search on depression in both uh, the United States and in Australia, you will be presented with this nine question uh, uh, qu uh, questionnaire, which is used to screen uh, potential 
patients at psychology departments around the world to see kind of where you fit on the uh, depression and anxiety scale. Even with physical ailments, you know, you've got a sore arm, you start searching sore arm, and then the next thing you're you're certain you have some wild, uh, rare disease that you'd never heard mm. of before because you're searching. I wouldn't also necessarily uh, trust any of the recommendations I would see in some of these self, uh, self-help kind of, or uh, support groups that I found on Facebook. But the very nature of just jump, joining into one of those those groups and seeing that you're not alone in any of the anxiety or depression that you might be feeling, because this has been a really trying year, as as you said, Sarah. That you know that this it's not surprising if you're doing it tough at the moment, and there is absolutely no shame in in looking at that, admitting that, and and seeking uh, help. I try to think of it the same way. You know, it's like my shoulder hurts. Huh, my shoulder still hurts. Hmm, I'm a little worried about my shoulder. Well, let me go online and see if I can get, you know, some help from an expert. Well, does the shoulder expert who's telling me what I should do have credentials? Do they work mm, for a publication mm. that I like and trust? You know, is there a history of of information in the past that that has been helpful? It's like, it's all kind of the same thing. And it's hmm. easy to say, oh, we'll just do it that way. But I think for a lot of folks, it's, 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 uh, it is an ongoing process. Totally, totally. And, um, you know, the, the final thing I would say is just, uh, psychology and, uh, therapists can seem very, very expensive, but, uh, I didn't include this in the story cause it had to be for print. So it had to be shortened. Um, uh, but you uh, go to, uh, uh, psychology in your state and do a Google search there, you'll find there, there are always kind of free clinics or free support out there. And um, quite often universities will have uh, low cost uh, people that you can see as well. So yeah, explore what is out there in the physical world as well as online, but uh, online is a great place to start. When your eye swells up from allergies, I don't know, just picking <laughs> that at, at random, uh, <laughs> you, you, you go to the doctor, you, you, mm. you don't feel ashamed. Tom. Yeah. You yeah. The, you know, you go, <laughs> you, you go, you go to the doctor. You're like, Hey, my eyes swelled up. And they're like, Oh, let me give you some medicine for that. Right. Um, mm. mental issues shouldn't be any different. You know, I, I struggle with anxiety, uh, problems, but over the years, doctors have tried different things and we've been able to track it down to most likely being something with my thyroid and thyroid medication has made a world of difference for me in oh, managing right. it ha as has cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, mm -hmm. just to kind of deal with the symptoms. And, you know, there's, there's no shame in any of that. It's like any more than there'd be like, oh, I, you know, I, I had to put this ointment on a cut to heal the, mm. the you know, this antibiotic yeah. ointment. It's, it shouldn't be any different. As, as human beings, we're so uh, good at uh, being, you know, compassionate and, and supportive empathetic. Yeah. and empathetic to other people. But then we screw up once and we just, you know, we um, think about it constantly and uh, we're, we're so less compassionate to our own selves. The Puns only safe everybody. comedy is a pun. Puns Actually, hurt that's everyone, not even true. Tom. Yeah. That's, yeah. And you can make a really just, tasteless pun. No are. one wins. Lion Jim Video says, I think puns are illegal in China and North Korea. Uh, they are illegal in North Korea. That uh, I believe they are just highly regulated in China. You have to, you you have to submit being... your pun to a ministry. Okay. Okay. And then I thought you were being serious, darn it. <laughs> For a second, you actually got me. All this right. is Tom's stand-up routine. Lamar. Yeah. <laughs> See, oh, the victim weird. there was North Korea. No one minds. <laughs> okay, hold on. Jim oh. Video in our Discord just sent an LA Times article titled No Laughing Matter, China's Media Regulator Bans Puns. 2014, <laughs> LA Times. Oh, 2014. Yeah. The State General Administration of Press, Publication, Radio, Film, and Television issued an order restricting puns and irregular wordplay on television and in advertising. Oh, wow. <laughs> because puns could mislead young readers and make it more difficult to promote mm -hmm. traditional mm -hmm. Chinese culture. A regular I mean, word... I guess that's true sometimes, but that's Maybe it just a little more much. fiber. This is amazing. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Wang Chao Yu, the former dean of the School of Communications at East China Normal University, said, The big difference in the internet age is that the people who have the privilege of creating puns and idioms have changed. It's no longer restricted to the elites or the well-educated. <laughs> so we have to ban them. <laughs> yeah. Pun, puns are running rampant. Yeah. Yeah. The every, Everybody's every on that train. People. You can't yeah. have that. You can't have that low brow everyday common man <laughs> pun. Just <laughs> running a muck. You can't just have anyone making a pun. Chaos. <laughs> it's going to be nuts. Or I have 
finally met my harassing four-legged rodent, and I have dispatched him. Right. Anybody who's ah. been following Roger's uh, uh, rat hunt. Rat hunt. Ooh, that sounds like a great board game. Uh, audio oh, listeners, oh, I'm sorry. You cannot see that Sarah has achieved her dream. Oh! But... Oh! <laughs> what? Is there something on my face? Yeah, yeah. the rat head. Oh. Is that a mouse, though? That might be a mouse. It's well, cute. Snap Camera said it was a rat filter. So Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Nice. I'll, I'll take Snap Camera at its word. Yeah. And it's, it's time rat. to start the show. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I feel like you guys could get over it, but I will I will change it back because we are professionals. Uh, <laughs> sometimes people say, you need a better camera. Oh, my gosh. There's a spider on my monitor. Okay. I'll just keep going. Um but uh, but yeah, that's it's sort of the oh you want to get into video podcasting start with that it's relatively cheap and does a good job and this seems like uh, the for seventy bucks it's a uh, it's seems to be right in that right in that wheelhouse. How's the spider? The spider is dead. <laughs> oh well, <laughs> I'm sorry. It just wasn't something I could missed. deal with for the rest of the show. I understand. We understand. Can I introduce you guys? I don't know if, if, uh, if this is her, her DTNS debut, but my mom be. is here. Oh, my gosh. Please bring Gloria onto our stream. Show yourself. Yay. Ladies and gentlemen, presidential vote receiver, Gloria Young. That's me, apparently. Yeah. Oh, well, it's nice to meet all of you as well. I feel oh, like I know you because that. I've heard you on all of Justin's podcasts. But yes, it's lovely to say hello. Well, it, that's great. It's it's good to be here. Very happy to be visiting. How, you can is, tell is us for real. What do you think of the house? Yeah. I love it. Oh, good. Okay. Love it. And we just did a little uh, Austin tour. We went to see the state capitol. We went to SoCo. Mm-hmm. South and, of Congress. Um, All right. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, so it's cool. Love being here. Oh, that's great. Oh, it's so nice to say hello to you. Okay. (laughs) Take care, everyone. (laughs) All right. Thanks, Gloria. Bye, Gloria. Gloria Young, ladies and gentlemen. Gloria Young. You know, it was your conversation with her on the PX3 Extra this morning that prompted me to tweet about 1979. Oh yeah, you, you you just got a you just got a very audible ah <laughs> from Glowbug as she made her way downstairs. You no, know, uh, Owen, Tom's least favorite pie is an apple pie, which it's says true. a lot. So, well, we you, I don't know if you you should know that me and Tom have a tumultuous relationship. You know, again, I tell everyone this, but he's yeah, like, of course, and of course, it goes to pies. How are you gonna <laughs> Pie. Who, who, how un-American is that? Huh? You got me on the ropes now. So nothing I say, <laughs> nothing I say can can get me out of this apple pie hole that I've been cast in. Again, I'm I'm all this, American classics when it comes to pies. Tom's See, big cherry big pie is number one for me. That's the best. That's because you're a grown man loving such a sweet surprise. Sweet cherry pie. I'm a big Warrant fan. Oh you're yeah. Right. yeah, yeah that's what it is. That. You probably never had a cherry pie. You're just singing the song in the back. <laughs> But I have the CD single from Warren right now. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd have had that, I, I might have just Please got on the that. And I don't yeah. know how to break my tie for third because pumpkin sweet potatoes, like they're. It's a difficult conversation because you're like, no, I know. I know what I like. And then you're like, oh, no, pumpkin. That was my number one. Where's pecan I feel like pie? now yeah. is the right time to admit that. I've never had a sweet potato pie. No, no, we 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 all know we all know you haven't had a sweet potato pie because you put pumpkin pie so high. <laughs> I might find out. I've got, a, I've got a pie guy. He he'll make it. He'll freeze it, and I will ship it to you overnight. I, I have a pie. Ask wait, Anthony, a pie I said stuff. I ship right. it. I'm not playing. I accept. Yes, it's gonna happen. I'm so excited. That was the pleasantest of shows. Oh. I'll tell you what it was. It was double stuffed, man. We, we, yeah, we it were, was hitting, hitting, hitting the red lights. That, that's always good, man. You were think that we were Lyndon Baines Johnson the way that we were dangerous, dangerously ignoring the reds. <laughs> uh, that you, that's a winner right there. Uh, <laughs> There's somewhere I just know there. It's a hundred percent. I just it's just like you know, Curry level confidence with the jokes that Tom will laugh. Talk about first party targeting, right? Like, oh yeah, 
No, that was yeah. full of personal information. That was that was pre pre Cambridge Analytica, pre Apple uh, ad shutdown, Facebook level targeting. The only one person who would enjoy that joke more than I did was Richard Nixon. I can't remember the oh Judas Priest guitarist. Do you hear about this? By the way, what I I don't think I have. Okay, yeah. so he had a he had a bypass or something. Is it like a recent made, story? Recent yeah. story. Yeah, he, okay. did, he did yeah, a heart yeah. bypass thing, whatever. He's you know getting on his years, but uh, great recovery, doing great. They're on tour. They have a new album, so he's up there. All those old Jews priest guys up there, and he's wailing on some uh, solo that he's famous for. And then during that, he could tell something was wrong, but wasn't totally sure what. Uh, but apparently one of the valves or something busted and started just pumping blood into his chest cavity while oh. he's doing this, this, uh, you know, this solo. E epic solo. Yeah. And he finished it before <laughs> oh God, we went and did anything chills. about it. Yeah. Which tells me like that that's the most metal fear. thing anyone's ever done before. That is the most metal thing I've ever heard of. It, I'm having, then, I'm literally having chills right now. Just thinking I know, about right? It. If, it's like, oh. if I remember the story correctly, that he went off stage for a few minutes and was seen for it, and then went back out and finished the show, and then went to the hospital. Yeah, he thought he could so, just get through it. That's happening right then while he's going, dee, 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 and his heart's all. I don't think I could watch that. Yeah, it was hard. Yeah. It was hard for me. Anytime I have an anxiety attack, and anybody who has anxiety attacks knows yeah. this, you have to convince yourself you're not having a heart attack, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. And my greatest yeah. fear is that I will do too good of a job and convince myself I'm not having a heart attack when I'm actually, when you're you know, having one. my Dude, valve this has exact, broken and it's pumping exact blood. Exact like, same just thing. keep playing exact. the solo. It's just an anxiety attack. I'm fine. Oh, my fine. gosh. I didn't know you and I shared that one oh, yeah. thing because I do that all the time when that happens. Yeah. And you do. You get good at it, right? So you're right. good at controlling it. You're yeah. good at knowing when they recognize in the Fear signs. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is yep. the <laughs> But then eventually when it really happens, if it does, are you going to be all, oh, I know what this is. I'll just do right. the old routine. Just calm oh, down, man. Tom. Yeah, calm down. Just have, do, your, do your guitar solo while your heart fills, <laughs> your chest fills with blood. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. This, yeah. Stark Squirrel. This seems fine. <laughs> yeah, this is fine. <laughs> uh, is it possible to summarize the metaverse, Nate? Heck, I'm going to do my best. Um, I think there is this ex expectation that a lot of people have that the metaverse is actually something that we can define today. Um, and it's something that companies like Facebook and Microsoft now are, are trying to do. And it generally feels like uh, most people's perception is that uh, the metaverse is just around the corner and it's something to do with VR and 3D worlds. Um, the reality is much, much more likely that what we think of the metaverse as being is probably 10, 20 years uh, away from now. If you take a little step back, the, a key component to what will make the metaverse a metaverse um, is not whether it's 3D or not, it's not whether it's VR or not, it's whether um, objects, things, experiences, purchases, objects, um, things um, can move from one bit of a metaverse to another and retain uh, that portability, retain that value. You can take that virtual object and you can go and put it in uh, in, uh, in something in, in Minecraft, or you can move it over to something you're playing in Roblox. Or if you're, if you're a child and you're playing Roblox and you've built something or you've created something, but then 10 years later, you're older and you're not playing Roblox anymore, but you really like that thing that you did, you, in a metaverse, as we envision it, you should be able to take that from Roblox and, and take that with you. As you grow and mature, that thing that you have should be able to move with you. Um, and you should be able to pass it on and sell it or, or, or what have you. It, it should retain that value. If you think back to the early days of the web, the web was created after the internet. It was a thing you could use the internet for. And, but it was created by researchers and scientists and you know the military to a certain extent and, and geeks in schools and in research facilities. And it wasn't driven by a commercial interest, shareholders and, and so forth. Do you think that fits in with what Andrew Bosworth was saying at Facebook Connect uh, when he described it as something in the internet right now is something you look at when the metaverse has kind of arrived, it'll be something you're in. Uh, I agree with part of it. I think VR will be a way of interacting with the metaverse in the way that a high resolution screen is a better way of interacting with the web than a very low res, tiny little screen. Um, it's this, you know, fundamentally underneath the surface, underneath the screen or the VR glasses or whatever, the information, the objects, the experiences, they're all basically the same, but are the ways in which we interact with it 
that's kind of how things are being shaped and made exciting, frankly, and probably made commercial. Um, so he, I, I would agree with a lot of what he's saying, but you know, mm -hmm. it, it it's 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 going to be very interesting. But I'm skeptical that any one company can do this. It can't. It has to be open by design. Yeah. Oh man, we're getting we're getting zoom bombed. Who's that? Who uh -oh. just joined the uh, joined the call? I don't know. <laughs> Who is this mysterious person? Why, why are we saying zoom? I because yeah. people understand that term, <laughs> oh. even though we, yeah, if I <laughs> you say Skype bomb, like hey Sarah Lane, hi, Hello, Lane. Woo! hi, hello everybody. I'm sorry I missed the good day internet. Oh, oh you missed it. Was now great, but. But I'm here now. How's it feel to be Dag back Nabbit. in the saddle there? Uh, yeah. It feels good. It feels really good. I, you know, I, I kind of hope to be back sooner than this, but um, understandable. Really, really glad to be back. I missed everybody a lot. Ah, we missed you too. Thank you. You see all those Sarah emojis in chat right now? It's like a wall of Sarah. I'm not looking, but thank you in advance. <laughs> Don't make me cry. Don't. Do ah, it. we won't. All right. It wasn't all fun, but in general, that was a lot of fun. Uh, that's it for this episode of DTNS slash GDI. We're live Monday through Friday, usually 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 21.30 UTC. Of course, we're not live again until January 4th. But starting January 4th, go to dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we're back tomorrow right here in this feed with our predictions results show, where we're going to judge how well we predicted the tech landscape of 2021 back at the end of 2020. No one should have to spend New Year's Eve alone every year. Ritual Misery presents the Diamond Club New Year's Eve Streamathon, 27 hours of raising money for sick kids through extralife.org. This year, Sarah and Tom, that's me, will be bringing in the new year with a live show. Join us on New Year's Eve at 2330 UTC, 1530 Pacific for good year internet. You can find all the details, including the full schedule at ritualmisery.com slash streamathon. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>